Speakers are now. Gentleman is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material on the subject of my special order. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is the tale of two cities, but not a tale about the cities, but about two examples of America's great embarrassment and failure to treat a brain disease called mental illness, especially serious mental illness. <clears throat> it is also a tale of Congress's repeated failure to address this, despite the cries of millions of Americans to do something about it. What we here in Washington tend to do, when we hear of another tragedy that has occurred somewhere in the nation, the tragedies we know by the names of Sandy Hook Elementary School or Columbine or Aurora, Colorado, or Tucson, or Santa Barbara. What Washington tends to do is we have a moment of silence, but the people want, and members of Congress want, moments of action and not moments of silence. Let me elaborate on this tale. In this building, the U.S. Capitol, back in the 1980s or 1990s, I believe, Two police officers were killed when Russell Weston came into the Capitol seeking a red crystal and ended up shooting these police officers. Under his diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia, he was pushed with his delusions and hallucinations to take action. It ended up in tragedy. There was also recently over the break another man, Larry Russell Dawson, who has been seen around this Capitol as once allegedly disrupted proceedings in this chamber and allegedly also suffers from some levels of mental illness, who when entering the Capitol Visitor Center, a pistol was seen when going through the x-ray, and when he grabbed that pistol, police officers shot and wounded him. First of all, it is amazing to me that people did not die. We know at the entrance of the Capitol Visitor Center is a highly secure environment with many, many Capitol Police officers. These brave men and women who put themselves between danger and members of Congress and the public show tremendous restraint and judgment at that moment. I might add that many times when a mentally ill person has a conflict, a violent conflict with a police officer, <clears throat> where they may be reaching into their jacket or maybe pointing a pistol or approaching a police officer with a knife, it's estimated between a quarter and a half of those mentally ill people involved in a police encounter end up dead. That's, that's a few hundred <clears throat> each year. Those, that is the tale in Washington, D.C. when why are we dealing with mental illness as a violent threat instead of in treatment? We deal with it because in this nation, sadly, when someone with mental illness has reached that level where they become violent, we call the police. The rules are, which we will look at tonight, prevent people from getting treatment. We do not have enough providers. We don't have enough places to put people, so we call the police. Now, I should start off by saying the mentally ill are no more likely to be violent than non-mentally ill, except when you look at those with serious mental illness, such as schizophrenia, bipolar, and other illnesses such as that. They are 16 times more likely to engage in an act of violence than someone who is in treatment. Again person who's seriously mentally ill and not in treatment is 16 times more likely to engage in an act of violence than someone who is not than someone who's in treatment. <clears throat> On the West Coast in Seattle, another tragedy was brewing. A man named Cody Miller climbed a tree, a giant sequoia tree in downtown Seattle, and it created something of a furor. First, I want to read parts of an article that appeared in the New York Times on March 29th that described this to show you how out of touch we are as a society when dealing with mental illness. It said that for more than 24 hours last week, Cody Lee Miller perched in a giant sequoia in downtown Seattle, pelting people in cars with pine cones and tearing off branches. Investigators are, were investigating how much it would cost 
using some complicated formula that goes far beyond the value of natural beauty, the article said. A Seattle tree expert said Mr. Miller caused $7,800 in damage, according to court documents released this week, and investigators took into account the tree's age, its potential lifespan, and how much of its lush foliage was denuded. The form that created by professional forces goes like this. The trunk is 34 inches in diameter at breast height, and investigators' reports said the tree has 95% species rating, 100% condition rating, and 100% location rating. And the sequoia's pre-damage value was put at $51,700. But after Mr. Miller's arboreal escapade, the tree lost 15% of its value, which document shows was now worth only $43,900. The damage to the tree was expensive, the report said. Well, Mr. Miller was charged on Monday with first-degree malicious mischief and third-degree assault. He's also ordered to stay away from the tree by observing no unwanted contact. I repeat, by observing no unwanted contact, that's in quotes, with the tree. Now, the story goes on to describe <clears throat> trees and sequoias, but and the, not until the very end of the article. It mentions... Mr. Miller's mother, Lisa Gossett, said that she had not talked to her son for some five years. She saw it on the news, and she barely recognized him. See, what was happening is Lisa Gossett and her daughter sat in their Alaska home watching this clip of the man perched in the tree. With her heart broken, with tears streaming down their faces, Lisa and her daughter soon came to realize they were watching their son and her brother become the latest internet mockery of a mentally ill person. You see, <clears throat> when Cody Lee Miller climbed this 80-foot tree and sat there for 25 hours, he was supporting, he was supporting a bushy beard and ragged clothes, and most Americans were amused by this, and they called it hashtag man in tree. It was an international viral story overnight. But this was no joke, this was no prank, but was the culmination of untreated mental illness that once again our society turned into a joke and we wonder why there's a stigma when newspapers like the New York Times <clears throat> write a mocking story like that towards a man who has a disease. Would they have written an article like that if it was about someone with cancer or diabetes or AIDS or any other disease? My guess is no. But somehow in our society it's okay to mock a person who's suffering from schizophrenia. <clears throat> when he was younger, he was clean-cut and rambunctious, loving and happy. That's the words his friend used to describe him. At a young age, he was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. However, other than excess energy, like any child, he didn't support any behavioral issues. But then, six years ago, his mother began to notice an unusual shift in his son's behavior as he grew increasingly paranoid. And let me note here that serious mental illness, about 50% of the time, emerges by age 14, and 75% of the time by age 24. It's very, very difficult to predict, although we've now indicated some 108 genetic markers of schizophrenia and bipolar illness. Still, the issue is many parents have a loving and caring child, then something changes. And his behavior changed when Lisa would find knives stored under her son's pillow. And when confronting Cody about her discovery, he would simply respond, it's just to keep us safe. And as time passed on, Cody's mental instability progressed. He refused to enter certain stores downtown. When making an exception, Cody would cover his face with a hood, convinced people were constantly staring, him, staring at him. Following this enhanced paranoia came the emergence of night terrors and constantly crying and shouting for his mother during the night. Cody would shriek in fear of the, quote, evil presence, unquote, surrounding him. This worrisome behavior continued to escalate as Cody spiraled out of control. He could be found walking down the street in high socks and clown glasses, spreading deer bones on the road. He hit a man with a flat tire and began to have dreams of killing his grandmother, going so far as setting her woodshop on fire. At that point, his grandmother said she could no longer handle him and sent him out. He was caught in the revolving door of the United States' broken, embarrassingly and shamefully broken mental health system. He was constantly shuffled between homelessness and incarceration. Lisa pleaded for others to help her son and appealed to the Alaska governor's office, mental health evaluators, and probation officers for assistance. But despite her efforts, Lisa's attempts to get her son proper treatment seem hopeless due to the bureaucratic morass that is our mental health care system, which is not really a system at all. 
She was sidelined from helping her son due to the inefficient system and forced to sit by and watch as Cody eroded over time. We pretend in our own deluded state that all the seriously mentally ill are fully aware of their symptoms and welcome treatment. The fact is many don't. Forty percent of individuals with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder don't even recognize that delusions and hallucinations aren't real. This is a medical condition called anosognosia. Anosognosia is also something you see in people with dementia or Alzheimer's or stroke. It's very real and the person is not aware of their own problem. But somehow we come up with this anthropomorphism which says, well, they can decide for themselves. They cannot decide for themselves when they don't even know who they are, that they exist, what planet they're on. They see things differently, they hear things differently, they smell things differently. They encode information differently into their brain, they process it, they recall it differently. So for us to say that they just don't want treatment is a fool's errand on our part. Can you imagine if we said that again to someone with cancer? You don't understand your disease, diabetic, we're going to dismiss you. What if a person clutched his chest in a heart attack and laid unconscious in the street? Would we tell that person, we're not going to help you until you wake up and tell us to treat you? Or worse yet, would we say to that person, we're not going to treat you until you are in imminent danger of killing yourself or killing someone else? No, but that's what we do with the mentally ill. You know, the Energy and Commerce Committee on Oversight and Investigations that I chair had a couple year study paving the way for my bill, the Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act, with 187 co-sponsors from both sides of the aisle. My bipartisan measure addresses the shortage of psychiatric beds, clarifies HIPAA privacy laws so families can be allowed to have some compassionate communication and be part of frontline care, and it helps patients get treatment well before their illness spirals into crisis. My, legis my legislation has been endorsed by dozens of publications and newspapers, including the Washington Post, the Seattle Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Wall Street Journal, and the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. And each day, I hear from countless families from across the country who are experiencing a mental health crisis and are counting on our efforts to bring positive changes to the mental health system. We cannot let these families down. Lives are depending upon it. We cannot wish this away, and denial is not a treatment. But let me tell you what Americans have to say about this. Because as we're dealing with this issue, Americans are wondering why Congress is not acting. Why is Congress being so passive? Why aren't we doing what we need to do? Well, I want to tell you about the story that I posted on my Facebook page, and this picture that I posted as well. This is Cody Lee Miller in court. Look at his hair, look at his beard. This is a man that obviously has not been taking care of himself. In shackles on his ankles and his wrist, chained at his waist, led by two police officers wearing their purple gloves so they are not at risk of infection. While a judge sits in the background. This man who's diagnosed with schizophrenia being treated like a criminal. Now I wrote on my post this, friends, you really can't make this stuff up. A man who is diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, hashtag man in the tree, who desperately needs psychiatric care is brought in shackles before a judge because he's been charged with first degree malicious mischief and third degree assault. And what was the outcome? The judge ordered him to stay away from the tree. But first he needs to make $50,000 bail. Just look at this picture and tell me our mental health system isn't a mess. It's unbelievable. Recall that for 24 hours last week, Cody Lee Miller remained atop a giant sequoia tree in downtown Seattle. And since that, since that time, there's been a greater outpouring of concern over the tree than the plight of this young man who's so clearly in the throes of a psychotic break. I make reference here to that article from the New York Times, far more concerned about the tree than a human being. He goes, I wrote further, he's ordered to have no unwanted contact with a sequoia, yet no concern about getting treatment. Such a sad indictment against an abusive system that would order no contact with a tree, yet remains silent on getting the mentally ill into care. 
Cody's mom talks about his downward spiral and has made it her mission to be a voice for families who desperately want to help their loved ones but are blocked by federal and state laws that make it impossible to help mentally ill family members. But meanwhile, Congress is still stalling my Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act, H.R. 2646. Well, this posting must have hit a nerve. Members of Congress all have Facebook pages and Twitter and we have our social media. And many times when we post something, we may hear from a few thousand people. As of a few minutes ago, this posting has led to 1.8 million hits on my Facebook. And what is also compelling <clears throat> is this sad as this story is about this man treated like a prisoner, like a common criminal, instead of getting treatment, are the heart-wrenching comments made by the families. And I want to read some of them to you. These are people from around the world, really, who commented on what is happening here. Holly Huntley Perone wrote, I agree with Cody's mom. The real culprits of the state and federal laws that prevent loved ones from being able to help family members in trouble. And by that, I reference laws which say that unless you're in imminent danger of killing yourself or someone else, no one's going to force you into treatment. Or laws that say, if this person says they don't want help, you can't make them get help. Or if the person in the midst of a delusion says, don't tell my mother or my father because they're part of the CAA or they're a Martian, they're planting thoughts in my brain, the doctors cannot tell the family members when is the next appointment, what is the medication, what is the diagnosis, how should they treat them. They may say, take them home. But when the family says, what should I do? We've heard of cases where the doctor said, we can't tell you because he doesn't want us to. But the family says, but I'm taking him home. What should I do? We can't tell you. One family member said to the doctors, well, let's just have a supposition, just pretend that there was a case of someone with schizophrenia going to my house, what should I do? And they said, we're not going to tell you. These go on to happen where family members may be in court pleading in tears with a judge, tell me where my son is, tell me where my daughter is, where is my father, my mother, my brother, my sister, tell me so I can do something for them. A caseworker may be sitting in the courtroom knowing full where, where that person is, knowing there are the problems, but say, I can't tell you because we believe their delusions or a reality that they somehow have a right to be sick instead of a right to be well. James Sobsack wrote, my guess is that he will get some mental health services in jail, evaluate him and see if they can petition him to a psychiatric hospital. This is a process, he says. Well, here's the problem. When we take the mentally ill people into jail, 80% of them get no treatment. 80% of people taken to jail get no treatment. And of those in jail, 40 to 60% of those in jail have some level of mental illness, many severely mentally ill. And what happens instead is a person is 10 times more likely to be in jail than in a hospital if they're mentally ill. And once there, they don't get treatment. They oftentimes are subjected to the abuse by other prisoners, may get into fights with prison guards, and then charged with another crime. And because of all these problems, a person with mental illness tends to serve a sentence four times longer for the same crime than a person with without mental illness. And when you discharge them, they don't get treatment. And so they get involved in this revolving door. But why? Why in heaven's name is jail the right place to send someone with a brain disease? And why is it that Congress doesn't wake up instead of passing so many silly bills all the time? We're willing to let people continue to die, by the way, at a rate of about 10 people an hour. Last year in the United States, 41,000 deaths by suicide, 45,000 plus deaths by drug overdose, somewhere between two and 500 deaths of a mentally ill person confronting a police officer. Thousands, and we don't even know accurately how many, of people who were homeless and died. One person who's home uh, in Los Angeles died every day who was homeless. And about 200,000 of these homeless people are severely mentally ill people. But we've gotten ourselves accustomed to stepping over them, to ignoring them, to treating them as an invisible class that doesn't exist, and somehow saying that's what they want to be, when they're not even aware. And we think it's comfortable for them to live in filth and squalor. If you add the numbers up, the total number of mentally ill who died last year in this country, it's probably well over 85,000, maybe 100, maybe 120,000. And I might add that even that lowest number is far greater 
than the total United States combat deaths in the entire Korean War and Vietnam War combined for the length of those wars. In one year in America, that's how many died. And what we do here is we throw them in jail. Well, quite frankly, many of them die in jail as well. Another comment. Jim Holden wrote, the system is a problem. We can't help these people because a personal choice is championed over their health and well-being. People in the streets need to be a danger to themselves or others before we can offer much needed help. As a social worker, I have always found this frustrating. Another woman, Jilly White, writes, my, my brother-in-law was just arrested for doing something during a psychotic break from his textbook schizophrenia. My husband's mom thinks he's finally going to get the help he needs now that he's in the system. Yeah, right. He's not going to be any better off. They don't give a rats when they can just shuffle him through the correction system. It breaks my heart to explain this to them, but look at the track record of them helping. Deb Smith writes, unfortunately our jails and juvenile centers have become mental health facilities. While a person has mental health problems, they also may commit crimes for which they can be arrested and held. This is a very difficult and often very dangerous situation for everyone involved. It is never as simple as them getting treatment. Nor is, it as simple, nor is it as simple as just set them free if they commit a crime. The judge has to look at all sides, including the safety of both sides, but for the individual and the citizens and the community, and what risk the person may have of further harm to himself or others if released. Sidney Irvin writes, there's still a shame and embarrassment about mental illness that's, that totally we don't understand. Then you have the people who believe mental illness is a myth. Until those attitudes change, probably by some respected celebrity having a psychotic break, mental health will stay in the shadows. Beverly DeMille wrote, the problem is the mentally ill have rights, and if they choose not to seek treatment, they have that right. The treatment given to them prior to the 1970s was forced and inhumane. They were locked up for decades, medicated, isolated, restrained. This doesn't happen much anymore, thank God. They have procedures done on them like prefrontal, they had procedures done on them like prefrontal lobotomies, and were subjected to shock therapy. It was cruel and unusual treatment for humans that didn't happen to see the world as normal people did. How would you like to witness this treatment forced on your parent, child, or loved one? I agree with most of that. We don't want those treatments again. Except when she writes, this doesn't happen much anymore, thank God. She is wrong. We should never allow again to bring back our asylums or this horrendous treatment. But we have gone from a time of 550,000 psychiatric hospital beds in this country in the 1950s to less than, than 48,000 now. In the 1950s, the population of the United States was 150 million. Now, it exceeds 316 million. There's about 10 million people with severe mental illness. 40% of them, 4 million or so, don't have any treatment. And what happens to them is they go to jail. When we close these asylums, People didn't all suddenly get better. Some got better because of medication. But we traded that psychiatric hospital bed for the prison cell. We traded that psychiatric hospital bed for the emergency room gurney when a person is given a five-point tie-down in sedation. We traded that psychiatric hospital bed for the streets and subway grates for the homeless. And we traded the psych bed for the county morgue, where many of them die as paupers waiting to be claimed. Lori Wellander writes, I suffer from major depression and had to do 10 days in jail. While there, they refused to give me my antidepressant medications. This seems to be the norm in my county's jail, just pretty sad. This man needs people who care about humanity, not to be treated like this. Rhoda Robinson Brown writes, how about our addicts who beg the judge for treatment and they get put in prison for years? Most think at least when they are in prison, they won't be able to use drugs. Ask any addict that has been in county prison how easy it is to still get drugs. You will have people say they don't want their tax money paying for addicts' treatment, but don't they realize it costs more to keep them in prison for years? Our justice system is broken. Indeed, a study done in Arkansas for their legislature found that it costs 20 times more to put a person with mental illness in jail than in outpatient treatment. 20 times more. Listen to this one. Sylvia Blanchard writes, as the mother of a bipolar son, my heart goes out to his family because there is no hurt that hurts as much as watching someone you love have this happen in their own life. My son passed away three years ago, and I still ache. I have a child who's in the same situation. He needs mental help. Then he needs to get treatment to deal with issues in his life that he ignores and uses drugs to hide from it. In and out of jail almost each week. Nothing parents can do when it's an adult child. 
so sad for our system. All states need to look at what the Ohio governor did to turn mental health and drug abuse around. Heidi Meyer writes, this all stems from a bigger problem in that there are too few beds in the mental health facilities for children. There's nowhere to get help for them when they're young. It just leads to messed up adults. This is a problem caused by the federal government. <clears throat> I told you that we have too few psychiatric beds, and one of the biggest culprits of that is Medicaid. For people who are low income, between ages 22 and 64, if you have a psychiatric problem, again, I can't make this nonsense up, it's true. <clears throat> person cannot go to a private psychiatric hospital with more than 16 beds. So where do they go? They put them in an emergency room, they put them in a general hospital psych bed, thinking they're going to save money. But here's what happens. If a person is in a psychiatric hospital bed, <clears throat> it costs about $500 a day. If they go to emergency room, it could be three or $4,000 a day. If they go to general hospital psych unit, it could be $1,000, $1,200 a day. The state of Missouri actually did a study on this and found it saved. 40% of Medicaid dollars by allowing people to go where the care is, to a psychiatric hospital, to understand that medications can work. And on this issue of medications, I want to call upon one of my colleagues to elaborate on this. Buddy Carter from the 1st District of Georgia, from Savannah, Georgia, knows well what medications can do when properly prescribed and properly followed to help treat with someone. So I'd like to, to yield three minutes to Representative Carter. Well, I thank the gentleman for yielding, and, and as the gentleman has stated, this is a serious problem, Mr. Speaker. This is a problem that I have dealt with as a professional pharmacist for many years. I've dealt with it in, in my retail setting, in my pharmacies, as well as a, as a consultant pharmacist in a long-term care facility and skilled nursing homes. And, and I've seen the advances that we've made in medicine over the years. I've seen us go from, from only having the, the the original antipsychotics, Haldol, which was always accompanied by a prescription for cogentin to, to mask the side effects that the Haldol was going to have. And I've seen the evolution of the atypical antipsychotics, which, while they do have some side effects themselves, are, are nowhere near the side effects that, that the original antipsychotics had. But I do thank the gentleman for bringing this important issue to light. And I do have a few comments that I'd like to make. First of all, medication makes a, plays a, a major role in the treatment for many mental illnesses. And with the growing burden of mental disorders worldwide, pharmacists are ideally positioned to play a greater role in supporting people with a mental illness. There's a growing amount of evidence to show that pharmacist-delivered services in mental health care help address the barriers that are hurdles for the broader mental health care team. Pharmacists have three roles they can play in helping our country address the mental health crisis. First, pharmacists can play a major role in the multidisciplinary teams addressing health care and can support early detection of mental illness. With more pharmacists coming out of school with greater clinical experience, pharmacists can work in new roles such as in case conferencing or collaborative drug therapy management. These new roles would also benefit from increased pharmacist involvement, such as the early detection of mental health conditions, development of health care plans, and follow-up of people with mental health problems. Secondly, pharmacists can play a role in supporting quality use of medicines and medication review, strategies, strategies to improve medication adherence, and antipsychotic polypharmacy in shared decision-making. Pharmacists would have a large impact regarding medication review services and other pharmacist-led interventions designed to reduce inappropriate use of psychotropic medications and improve medication adherence. Finally, pharmacists can help address barriers surrounding the implementation of mental health pharmacy services with a focus on organizational culture and mental health stigma. Over the years, the relation between the pharmacist and the physician has become more collaborative and cooperative. With this new relationship, pharmacists can work with physicians to develop strategies to change the attitudes and stigma surrounding mental health. As my colleague from Pennsylvania, Representative Murphy, continues to fight for this cause, I hope he will consider me and the profession of pharmacy as a friend and collaborator so we can fight to end the mental health crisis in this country. Again, I want to thank the gentleman for yielding me this time and for bringing this most important subject to light. And I yield. I thank the gentleman for his comments and your dedication to this issue. Mr. Speaker, I just want to, Mr. Stivers needs to make an announcement, so I'll yield a moment to him. Well,
I'll seek recognition. Mr. Speaker, I send to the desk two privileged reports from the Committee on Rules for filing under the rule. The clerk will report the titles. Report to accompany House Resolution 671, resolution providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 3340, to place the Financial Stability Oversight Council and the Office of Financial Research under the regular appropriations process to provide for certain quarterly reporting and public notice and comment requirements for the Office of Financial Research and for other purposes, and providing for consideration of the bill, H.R. 3791, to raise the consolidated assets threshold under the Small Bank Holding Company Policy Statement and for other purposes. Report to accompany Resolution 672, resolution providing for consideration of the bill H.R. 2666 to prohibit the Federal Communications Commission from regulating the rates charged for broadband internet access service. Referred to the House calendar and ordered printed. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now uh, like to call upon um, Mr. Blumenauer of Oregon, who has been absolutely steadfast in his compassion and caring for this. When I also add, it shows the bipartisan nature of our legislation. He's been instrumental in helping me understand other aspects of this. We've made a number of modifications to this bill and we will continue to work on these issues together. So I thank my friend and now I'd like to yield Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. I appreciate your courtesy in permitting me to speak uh, with you this evening. Uh, the sun is setting on our nation's capital. Uh, many of our colleagues uh, have returned to Washington, D.C. They are at dinner. They are with their families. They're meeting with their constituents. Uh, but I appreciate your being here on the floor this evening to highlight a critical area that you've been so committed to and worked on so hard because it's something that each and every American needs to address, needs to focus on, because we are all in this together. I will say that earlier in my career, uh, as a child state legislator, I was part of the deinstitutionalization movement. It made a lot of sense. Uh, as uh, you've said, my friend, we had over a half million uh, institutional beds and some of the conditions were not what they should have been some of the treatment certainly is uh, n any nothing that we would accept today and the notion of allowing people to be helped in a deinstitutionalized setting made sense for a lot of people but sad to say we didn't do a good job of implementing it. The institutionalization worked if we were there supporting the people who were deinstitutionalized with medication, with counseling, with housing. And sadly, when we hit some choppy waters economically uh, in my community and others around the country who followed what was in theory a good model, we found that there were too many people out on their own. And sadly, today, we can see evidence of the failure to do deinstitutionalization right on the streets of virtually every community, large and small, from coast to coast. I appreciate your efforts to help refocus the federal partnership. Certainly there's a role for state and local government, there's a role for the private sector, uh, there's a role for individuals and family. But the federal government provides resources, provides a framework, provides uh, a legal setting, uh, and we need to make sure that the federal framework reflects the lessons we've learned and the realities today. And I've been pleased that you have been so patient uh, with me and others who have carried to you some of the questions and concerns that we've picked up from people in our communities who care about it. You have tackled an area that is complex, it's controversial, um, and there's room for give and take. And I feel in the 
hours and hours that we've talked about this, exchanging information. I've seen that you've done just that. You've drilled down, you've listened, you've incorporated, uh, you've asked more questions. Um, and I, I appreciate that because I think you are establishing a framework here with a number of our colleagues on a bipartisan basis that will enable this Congress to be able to make real progress that's long overdue. In my community, we are going to open a facility in September. We call it the Unity Center. It's a collaboration between four major hospitals to have a place where we can take people with mental problems out of emergency rooms where they can't be appropriately treated, uh, where it's costly, um, and all we can do is stabilize them and then turn them back out on the street until their condition deteriorates, they pose a problem to themselves and others, and as you have referenced, too much of our mental health service in this country is to be found behind bars. That's not the appropriate setting, it's not cost effective, it's not humane. We're making a small step in our community where these institutions have come together established a memorandum of understanding. They realize they're still going to lose money, but they're not going to lose as much. And they're going to be able to give better care to a population that's very much in need. I'm hopeful, Congressman Murphy, that we will be able, as a result of the work that you are doing with this legislation and others uh, who you're working with, that we'll be able to focus that federal partnership yet this year to be able to have more assistance to our communities to make sure that the federal programs are tailored to the needs of today and the experience that we've acquired. I am hopeful that we will be able to develop more tools for one of the most important ingredients in this equation and that's the families who are too often prevented because of the regulatory framework we have, and it's, some of this is understandable, but it shouldn't be a barrier for families to be able to, in some cases, are the only people who really know the individual, who care about them, who are equipped to be a vital partner uh, with the mental health system. I look forward to further progress. I look forward to bringing back to you more information from Portland, Oregon, where we're going to have another roundtable discussion with concerned individuals in government, in the medical profession, uh, and advocacy groups to make sure that the input from my community is completely reflected in this. But let me just say how much I appreciate your time, your effort, uh, being a partner with you in this, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the result before the final gavel comes down on this Congress. I think the gentleman from Oregon, my friend, I think uh, when people look at Congress and wonder if people can work on issues in a bipartisan way, I'm sure if someone looked at our voting record on other issues, we would probably be a bit different. <clears throat> That's okay. What still stands is that we're able to come together with a common issue. I have no idea if this man is Republican, Democrat, registered to vote, nor should that matter to us. <clears throat> I've never asked a patient in my 40 years of practicing. And I know you're the same way too. We do this because compassion dictates that sometimes we are our brother's keeper. And we need to do the right things. And I do value your input on this bill. We've made a number of modifications. I know that in committee, uh, Democrats have offered several amendments which I want to incorporate, which look at some specific funding for a number of things. We need more psychiatrists, psychologists. We just have to have them. We have to put money into that. We need uh, more programs in there. We need to bolster community mental health services. We need to make sure that there's oversight over what states are doing with those dollars to make sure they are putting dollars into effective programs, not frivolous ones. That's one of the roles Congress has, to be watchdogs over that. I'm proud to say in front of the nation, you have been awesome in this, and I want to continue to work with you. We will solve this issue. If yes, the gentleman yield would the gentleman. yield, I just want to say one of the areas uh, that is most contentious deals when, when uh, people like the gentleman that you have pictured behind you um, are going to be compelled to have treatment. 
you have been open to being able to refine the protections to make sure that, that states, and this is something that varies across the country, to make sure that under the auspices of your bill uh, that we have appropriate safeguards to make sure that the rights of the individual are respected but acknowledge the fact that in some cases uh, that the right to, uh, for people to self-destruct is illusory. Exactly. It's dangerous to them, it's dangerous to society, and it's heartbreaking for their families. Uh, so and I, I have appreciated our conversations on that, going back and forth, and what you've tried to do to be able to make sure that the balance is struck. Uh, and I'm confident before we're through, we can make sure that the other areas that require that give and take can, in fact, be met. And I would like to thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of it and look forward to the next steps. I thank the gentleman. And, and what the gentleman is referring to is also something called assisted outpatient treatment. Mr. Speaker, that's a program whereby uh, 45 states and the District of Columbia, maybe 46 states now have this, <clears throat> where someone who has a history of incarcerations, of arrests, of violence, when they are not in treatment, a uh, judge uh, so it protects their rights and may review their case in terms of saying they can be put in inpatient care, but if the judge says they don't meet the, the standard of imminent danger to harm themselves or someone else, assisted outpatient treatment is what may be warranted for them, which means the judge simply says uh, you're going to stay and continue to take your medication, continue to see your therapist and work on this. Uh, <clears throat> and that being the case, when New York State did this, they found a reduction in incarcerations and homelessness by some 70 percent. It was pretty dramatic. They found satisfaction by over 80 percent, uh, and they found costs go down by 50 percent. <clears throat> so it is something that we as Congress need to continue to work. Uh, we did pass legislation which puts some money in the appropriations, some 15 million dollars to help states, states do that, but we have a long way to go. And it's a long way to go based upon what I said, some 1.8 mil, I think it's 1,800,820,000 people so far have commented and have seen this on my Facebook page and have commented on it. I want to give some more comments on um, some heartbreaking lessons uh, people are saying. A uh, woman by the name of Carrie Butler wrote <clears throat> on my Facebook page, they are falling through the cracks. It's easy to just put them in jail with a high bail. They don't take medication for people like him, my nephews, which is say one is in jail now since November and no release till August, mostly because he didn't follow up like he was supposed to. And the prosecutor did a mental evaluation on him to see if he could withstand court and concluded he could. But something's not right here. He has assaulted officers, have been tased three times and not affected. Five police officers it took to get him in the back of a car. They tased him in Walmart once in front of the whole store. And on it goes that there are many people with mental illness out there and, and this person writes I don't believe public servants have been trained properly to, to, re, to treat mental illness I don't know what to do to help people who get the help they need to be productive I might say one of the aspects of our bill is to provide training for police officers what's called uh, emergency treatment uh, for them and when police officers have been trained in that we actually see and the police officers like this too, they can quickly identify if this is a mentally ill person in crisis, what they can do to de-escalate the situation and prevent it becoming harmful or deadly. Here's another point written by Amethyst Lees. First off, health system is horrible and I worked inside a mental institution and saw firsthand what it's like. Depending on where I was, the people were not getting their needs met or were being ignored. I even saw an incident where a man was waiting for 15 minutes for two staff members to stop talking about football just to ask for some ice. He never got his ice because he, was, he lashed out for being ignored, and of course he was restrained in a chair for an hour for getting angry. Marion Kernan says with regard to Cody Miller, talk to him. Our mental health system is shameful. I know as I work daily with this population, many times their treatment is inhumane. Someone with dementia or Alzheimer's wouldn't be treated this way if they had a break with reality. It's a sad commentary on our lack of knowledge of dealing with serious mental illness. Here's some more stories. Angie Geyser writes, <clears throat> my 13-year-old daughter Morgan was in police custody for 19 months before she finally received treatment for her schizophrenia. 
We had to pursue a civil commitment to make it happen. Now she's back in juvenile detention, where she has no access to the outdoors and is not allowed to have physical contact with her family. The treatment of the seriously mentally ill by the criminal justice system is appallingly inhumane. Fred Trenker writes, Two weeks ago, a stranger that I've been married to for 13 years came into my home, sprayed me with pepper spray, took a knife out in front of my two kids, and threatened to cut his throat. The police took him away and put him in a mental health hold. I chose not to press charges and just requested that he get help. This was his second hospital stay in a month. The hold was supposed to be for seven days. Four days later, he got out, and I'm sure because he had a plane ticket out of the state. He convinced someone out there that I was a threat. He denied ever having a knife. He manipulated the system. I received abusive texts before I changed my phone number and sent terrible emails. I only wish he could get the help he desperately needs, wherever he is. But because of the unchecked mental illness, I now have two beautiful girls without their father and both needed their own mental health counseling. How do we help our system on all ends? Another woman writes, if you want people like this young man to get help, we all need to be okay with paying more taxes and closing privatized prisons. The prison system has become the dumping ground for the pervasive mentally ill. Another one writes, my uncle has schizophrenia. He disappears for months at a time. I worry constantly about him being hurt by law enforcement. He was living 50 miles away in the woods on his father's property in a camper and was threatened with a gun by a neighbor because he was walking in the fields talking to things only he can see. The cops were called and they showed up with weapons drawn. Then they took him away and locked him up for a month. He's only 32, but the police assumed he was on drugs. He was having a psychotic episode. There's not enough education in the judicial system about mental illness. And innocent people are being killed due to the ignorance. Another woman writes, my question is this. As the mom, where should we direct the young people with schizophrenia? Hospital care is effective, but seems to be temporary. Six months in and two years out. Repeat, has anyone found or used or heard of any successful treatment going on in treatment facilities? Well, the answer is yes. Actually, one of the programs in, in H.R. 2646, the Helping Families with Mental Health Crisis Act, is for something called RAYS, Response After Initial Schizophrenic Episode. We have learned that since schizophrenia and bipolar illness and severe mental illness is emerging in these adolescent and young adult years, if you get to someone early with low dose medication, with proper evidence-based treatment, their prognosis is much, much better. But when we don't treat someone, every time someone has what the, what the lay public calls a nervous breakdown or a psychotic break, a crisis, we have to understand that over time these lead to neurological damage. These are not harmless episodes. This is not just someone getting upset. This is a real psychiatric disorder that comes from the brain and leads to problems. And that's why we see these problems grow. Now here's someone who doesn't quite understand the problem. A woman by the name of Julie writes, I'm very much against the families of mentally ill patients having the power to, love, to put their loved ones away against the patient's will. Let the doctors determine if the patient is a problem, not the family. Often the family just doesn't want to deal with the illness, so they want the person to go away. A woman by name, someone by the name of Robin Duffy writes, Julie, you don't know what you're talking about. There are more of us that do care, but because of the mental health laws, we are unable to make decisions for our very sick family members. People with schizophrenia don't realize they are sick. They think their hallucinations are real along with the commanding voices they hear. So how can such an ill person make a logical decision to get the help they need? The answer is they can't. The doctors have to follow the laws that are in place, which is they cannot recommend committing a person unless they are an immediate threat or danger to someone or themselves. Yes, Julie, there are some families that don't want to be bothered, but I was not one of them. I highly recommend you to do research on the subject before you spout your ideas. Read the federal and state laws. And indeed, that is what we're trying to do with H.R. 2646. There are a couple thousand more comments on my Facebook page, Mr. Speaker. And I certainly ask people to go and read them. They are heartbreaking. They are horrifying. They are tragic. They are true. And they go on and on because our nation refuses to acknowledge this. So what we will probably do again... <clears throat> until we pass this bill and start making changes, we can predict it. There will be, in the, in the time that I've been speaking here, there have been several more suicides. 
There have been more homicides. There have been more mentally ill people which we abandoned. There are people who got chronic illness and, and died. Because the people with serious mental illness, for multiple reasons, tend to die 10 to 25 years sooner than the rest of the population because of the fact that 75% of those with mental illness have at least one chronic illness, 50% have at least two chronic illness, and a third have at least three chronic illnesses. I mean things like heart disease, lung disease, infectious disease, diabetes. And they get sick, and they oftentimes are not treated, many times they don't seek treatment. And we let them go in this slow motion death spiral and ignore them. So we've closed the hospitals, we put them in prisons, if they're out of control and the police bring them to an emergency room, there's no beds available, they tie them down to the gurney where they may wait for days or weeks in some cases, perhaps given some sedative, a chemical straitjacket, if you will, to calm them down. That is not treatment. That is abusive. That is our nation doing that, and Congress is culpable of this because we refuse to act. So once again, there will be a tragedy somewhere. I shudder to think. And I hope it's not anybody here that's injured. But somewhere out in America today, this is going to happen. And once again, we'll gather for a moment of silence. The gavel will come down, and we'll go back to our regular order of business. It is sad, and it disgusts me. But that's what we face. All this closing of hospitals and not opening up community mental health, Medicaid saying you can't see two doctors in the same day. Medicaid saying you can't go to a hospital with more than 16 beds. HHS saying we can't tell parents anything so they're left in the dark. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, which funds programs that teach people to make collages, to do interpretive dances, to get off their medication, to make masks and other things that have nothing to do with serious mental illness. We need to change the system, and that's what H.R. 2646 does. It takes that office of SAMHSA and changes it so that the director of it is the assistant secretary of mental health and substance abuse, and that person needs to be a doctor, a psychiatrist trained in either an MD or, or an osteopath or, or a psychologist, but someone who understands the field and not just someone who's saying, well, let's just do these other feel-good programs. The, state, the city of New York just did this too, where the mayor put up hundreds of millions of dollars for programs supposedly for the mentally ill. It wasn't for the mentally ill at all. It was programs like parks and bike trails and feel-good programs to help people with sadness, not dealing with depression and serious mental illness. How long can we, can, we, can we continue to fool ourselves? But this whole idea that says leave it up to them if they want to choose, don't provide them the help, make it the most difficult for those people who have the most difficulty. All of this Mr. Speaker, is more commentary and evidence that the grand experiment of stopping all treatment under the misguided, self-centered, and projected belief that all people who are mentally ill are fully capable of deciding their own fate and direction regardless of their deficits and disease, and that they have the right to self-decay and self-destruction which overrides their right to be healthy. The most fundamental, dangerous, and destructive hidden undercurrent of prejudice is low expectations that your disability is as good as it gets. The shift to considered changes in how we treat severe mental illness is the pendulum that needs to swing the other way. The grand experiment has failed of closing down all the institutions and care and stopping all treatment and not allowing community mental health. It's a principle that operated under the misguided, self-centered belief that people are always fully capable of deciding their own fate, regardless of their deficits and disease, and that the right to self-decay and self-destruction overrides this right to health, as I said. In so doing, we've come to comfortably advocate our responsibility to action and live under this perverse redefinition that the most compassionate Compassion is to do nothing at all. And it further bolstered the most evil of prejudices that the person with disabilities deserves no more than what they are. And under that approach, no dreams, no aspirations, no goals to be better can even exist. Indeed, to help a person heal is a head-on collision with the bigoted belief that the severely mentally ill have no right to be better than what they are 
and we have no obligation to help them. This is the corrupt evil of the hands-off approach in the anti-treatment model. And that perversion of thought is embedded in the glorification that to live a life of deterioration and paranoia and filth and squalor and emotional torment trumps a healed brain and the true chance to choose a better life. This is the movement of hatred and stigma towards the mentally ill disguised as the right to let them be sick. That hatred may be embedded in our own anger, our own resentment, and one's own past experiences projected as blame or misattribution of the lives of others, or maybe our own fear and loathing of the mentally ill. Either way, the outcome is tragically the same. So, we can have more moments of silence, or we can have times of action. I hope the Energy and Commerce Committee picks this up. I hope that more members of Congress will sign on as co-sponsors of H.R. 2646, the Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act. The day that bill signs into law, it will begin to save lives. It will begin to make a difference in people's lives. And of all the other things we do down the road here, here for images or to push polling, I can tell you this, the polling on this bill has in the 70s and 80s, and as politicians, we think, wow, if something polls at 55%, vote for it. My concern is, will America wake up and look towards Congress here and say, when we had a chance to do something to save lives, did we act? Or were we once again just caught up in moments of silence? Thomas Jefferson once said something along the lines of, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. We are in that same position now. And we can either have the courage to stand up and take action and help the mentally ill, or we can sit in silence. And I hope this chamber soon takes up H.R. 26, the Helping Families and Mental Health Crisis Act. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I yield back.